everybody, I'm Ryo Yamaguchi, the publicist at Copper Canyon Press, and uh, you're watching season two of our interview series, Line Break, um, which goes off the page and into the home and minds of our beloved poets. Uh, I've been carrying on the dream, kind of uh, sharing the dream of my predecessor from season one, uh, Lou Bucheri, Laura Bucheri, uh, of wanting to see more poets represented on the screen, talking shop, answering questions, and taking us behind the scenes of how they do what they do. So in uh, this episode, which is our very first of uh, season two, we have the extraordinary Tashani Doshi. Uh, Tashani, thank you for joining us from what must be nearly the exact opposite end of our planet. Um, how's your day been going today? Um, hi, Rio. Uh, yeah, things going well. It's seven o'clock uh, here in Tamil Nadu in India, and we had a sudden thunderstorm, uh, very unseasonal in the afternoon. Uh, and it's been, uh, it's been, so it's, it's, it's nice to have the weather disrupted slightly, but otherwise a good day. Yeah. Yeah, that's wonderful. Um, yeah, it's, well, it's very early here in the morning in uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico. My day is just getting started, but uh, I had a lot of dreams about our conversation uh, that kind of just floated yeah. me, I think. <laughs> you know, right into, uh, right into this morning. So um, it's nice. So, well, uh, it sounds beautiful there. Um, kind of in keeping with the spirit of the show, uh, Tashani, um, I was wondering if you could actually introduce yourself. Um, uh, let us know who you are, um, any pronouns you want to identify, uh, uh, you know, where you live, the most recent book you've published, and anything else you might want us to know? Sure. So uh, my name is Tishani Doshi. Um, I go by the pronouns she, her, hers. I published my last book of poems. Uh, it's called God at the Door, published mm -hmm. by Copper Canyon. And um, yeah, I thank you for having a, I don't have a <laughs> copy with me here. It's in the city. So, uh, so yeah, I, I live uh, outside of the city of Madras in, in South India. And uh, it's a pretty remote place um, on the coast. And I think uh, living by the sea has really informed uh, all my work, poetry, but I also write uh, novels and fiction essays. So I think uh, for me, this move out of the city uh, about 10 years ago has really been something that has change the creative direction for me as a writer, I think, partly because of the environmental sense of living on this very uh, beautiful but um, fraught uh, landscape, but also moving out of the city at a time when uh, people were moving in. Now, post pandemic, it's a little bit different again. And it seems like I did a really smart thing by moving out of the city. But, you know, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, you kind of, uh, well, you bring up maybe three or four things that I kind of wanted to ask you about. Um, but one of the main ones that I've noticed in, uh, in reading your work and, and particularly the poems in A God at the Door is this kind of confrontation um, or, or sort of intermixing between urban and na natural landscapes or wild landscapes. And I was wondering if you consider yourself either a nature or urban poet, or if you don't make that distinction at all. Yeah. Um, I should say, I shouldn't say post pandemic, we're not mm -hmm. post, we're still, mm -hmm. we're still no, of course, yeah, crawling yeah. through it. <laughs> yeah. Um, but you know, it's, it's really interesting. I've never lived in a huge, big city. Madras is a, you know, city of 8 million people. So that's big, but it always had this kind of small, uh, the, in compared to other Indian metros, it's not like the big Bombay or Delhi. It's always considered the smaller city. And I've never lived, um, you know, in New York. I lived in London briefly. So that's like the big city experience I have. But I've never thought of myself as a very, um, uh, a person who's wedded to or in love with the idea of the city. Although when I've been there, it's sort of charming and energizing for two days and then I'm quickly depleted. So I do get it. I get the allure of the city, the architecture, the mass, and, and how uh, it's the people that are coming in with their stories. I, I understand all of that, but I've always been interested in, in sort of landscape, in the sort of the margins of the cities. And I think more and more, I don't know that I separate the idea of nature from us. Uh, and I think that cities have their own nature you know I know a lot of poets who live in Delhi who 
who write about the the bird that you know has survived the smog and is on their balcony and and that's their nature and and I think in some ways we are always um, trying to make a connection I suppose between inner and outer and and the outer is is whatever landscape we happen to inhabit and more and more I've found myself wanting to feel secure in landscape but increasingly feeling insecure in landscape yes. so being able to find the beauty in it but struggling with the fact of its vanishing of of the dangers of you know the the entire sense of environmental collapse um and and yet at the same time finding moments of joy and beauty as footholds almost uh as a way of placing oneself in the landscape because that is the only thing that is available. Uh, and that's how the poem is made in a way uh, with this struggle in mind, I think between this inner and outer and between the beauty and, and the horror in a way or, or the fears, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm, I'm just taking to your poem about the elephants in the Okavango Delta and, and thinking about the calamity there um, but also, of course, and, and you've talked so much about this in other interviews, I mean, writing so much about the body. And another kind of thing mm -hmm. I see a lot in, um, in these poems in particular is sort of the body as landscape and the body as the earth and the world and um, obviously creationary um, kind of, you know, elements and motherhood in particular. Um, and yeah, I'm wondering if you, how deliberate you've kind of thought about that kind of inside outside dynamic um you know both as a writer and also as, as a dancer um and yeah yeah mm -hmm. that's a that's a really interesting thing and i think i i'm thinking about it all the time in some way and of course our relationship to our bodies change uh as we grow older and move into different directions in life and you know i began dancing quite late in life. I think I was 26 when I started um, and I didn't set out to be a dancer, but it certainly has become the kind of bedrock of my writing career because I was, I wanted to be a writer and a poet before then, but dance came into my life. And then it's through the sort of discipline of dance that I built up what it means to actually write and Partly it's the sort of daily returning to the theater. So creating a kind of practice ritual, um, but also within that, that sense of membrane and boundary, right? Like where do we go to create and make the poem? And so even if you're not a dancer, or even if you're not using your body in, in that very particular way, you're still sort of retreating from the world into the space of the poem. And I think I'm really interested increasingly with where we make those spaces, how we make them. And then also thinking about the idea of the reader, which I never used to think about so much, but where that poem is gonna travel to. And so the poem also has its own body and the poem is made of language and language is a house. And so I think in so many ways that poetry is a sense of shelter uh, and and you create this house of, of poetry in a way for yourself, but also for any possible readers. And I think partly it's because as a reader of poetry myself, I found so much shelter and in a way that it's a second body, you know, it's a kind of a place of, of, of retreat or reclamation or, or yeah, just, you know, uh, hiding out for a while or nurture. And so these are all ideas that I think of and, and how all of that in some way comes from this thing that we carry, this, this body, you know, and how far we are from it. And I think I have a lot of poems where I'm talking about this disconnect and always it's like trying to eliminate that line between inner and outer or trying to access one from the other and saying actually no there's no difference you know I am that and that is I and I am the cosmos and the cosmos is me and this whole tension between individual collective micro macro and it's 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 always shifting. There's never a sense of you can never be in that aha moment of complete clarity and wonder for a very long time. 
but the poem allows you a kind of hint every now and again, you know? And, and so some poems we are more, lean more into that idea of a kind of wholeness, I would say, and others are really pushing back against it and looking at the cracks and saying, no, I am so far from myself and from the world and I'm trying to, I'm trying to be with it again, you know? Yeah. Oh, that's, that was so beautifully put. I love this kind of, I mean, what I'm hearing you say is this kind of like contraction and expansion of, of a closeness to yourself. And, and I, I also love this idea of that the body is your own shelter and the poem, the body of the poem is a shelter. That was kind of another way I had, I had sort of written the question was that there's sort of three bodies in your work. There's the human body and the body of the poem and, and the body of, of the earth, you know, and the landscape. And, but as you're talking about practice and and your and you know your your own relationship with readers, um, I, I think it's a good moment to kind of do something more of our introductory thing. I, I wasn't certain if you had selected some poems, maybe that you wanted to read. We kind of jumped, uh, you know, right into this interview, and so we didn't have a chance to check on that. But um, but do, do you have something you might want to read now, or um, yeah? Um, sure. Uh, fr from from my book. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Or something else too. I mean, whatever you know. <laughs> Your okay choice. and only if you'd um, like to of course yeah but, yeah. yeah i'll do i'll do one poem um this is um from it's sort of the second last the penultimate poem in the book it's called survival dear ones who are still alive i fear we may have overthought things it is not always a war between celebration and lament now we know death is circuitous, not just a matter of hiding in the dark or under a bed, not even a slingshot for our loved ones to carry. It changes nothing. Ask me to build a wall and I will build it straight. When the end came, were you watching TV or picnicking in a field with friends? Was the tablecloth white? Did you stay silent? or fight. I hope by now you've given up the fur coat, the frequent flyer miles. In the hours of waiting, I heard a legend about a woman who was carried off by winds, a love ballet between her and the gods, which involved only minor mutilations. How I longed to be a legend to stand at the dock and stare at this or that creature who survived, examine its nest, marvel at a tusk that can rake the sea, fluid, sea floor for food. Hope is a noose around my neck. I have traded in my rollerblades for a quill. Here is the boat, the journey, the camp. If we want to arrive, we must push someone off the side. It is impossible to feel benign. How many refugees does it take to build a mansion? I ask again, shall we wait or run? Here is winter, the dense packed ice. Touch it. It is a reminder of our devastation, a kind of worship, an incantation. Just give that just a moment of space there. That was really staggered me back to Shani. Um, I'm thinking of you have spoken so beautifully about time um, in previous talks, and I'm thinking so much. And when I've been kind of trying to organize this interview of of wanting to go kind of in the past and in the future, and hearing this poem now, I mean, it's, you know, being a legend standing at the dock, you know, standing at the end of what feels like the end of something, right? And this transformation, and I want to talk about that, and, and I know we will, but um, maybe before we do, I, I do want to, I'll keep in the spirit again with Laura's, um, with season one, and, and sort of the questions Laura mm -hmm. would ask. I, I love this question. So I want, let's go back um, in your life. And I, I want to ask you, like, I'm wondering, when when do you think when's the first time you saw yourself in in a book uh, in a movie in a, in a piece of music um, you saw you know when you felt yourself in a piece of art um, you know what was that piece of mm. art uh, yeah 
I think, I mean, I, I can't remember the first time. That's such a strangely emotional question. I don't know, it's like, <laughs> I don't know why it should be so, but- I've, um, I've seen it with others. I, yes, mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think it's, a, it's this question of recognition, right? It's this sense of, mm -hmm. um, even though you read something for the first time, it's a feeling that, you know it or it sees you or there's some understanding which implies a prior relationship and that's one of the most beautiful things that literature and language can do is that it brings you in in that fashion and so you read a poem for the first time and you you think uh, you know you're 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 in it in this way and and i think for me one of the uh, poets who did that for me um, was the poet Kamla Das, who I read um, as a young woman. And she um, she wrote these very uh, strong poems about what it meant to be a woman living in, within an Indian society. And she, you know, she was considered quite scandalous because she wrote about menstruation and this and that and, and love affairs. And she, she, she also used, you know, quite colloquial language. And it was just this sort of sense of, oh, I didn't know you could write about this or you could write in this way. Yeah. But I think it, it keeps happening, that sense of, it's, it's never just the one time, because I, I think another moment I remember is sort of being an undergraduate in, in North Carolina, in Charlotte, and read, taking a creative writing class and reading Mark Doty and reading James Tate and Mary Oliver and these, you know, American poets and something about language um, released something in me. There was this sense of nowness and contemporary, uh, you know, fizz that felt very exciting. And I, I, I thought, oh, poetry is also this, and I can do this. And even though I'm not American and I'm not writing about these, maybe some of these topics or themes or these landscapes, um, I feel so close to these poets, you know, yeah. and they are unlocking something. And then it keeps happening and happening and happening. And I think as a, a reader and as a writer, you go to those experiences for those doors to keep being unlocked because you want some new opening. You know, you want to keep that sense of recognition. You want that eyes to be opened again and again in different ways, you know. Yeah, because it's yeah. so powerful it's so it's such an amazing thing to have that experience yeah absolutely and and i wonder if i hear you saying a little bit and, and just correct me if i'm misinterpreting this of this idea that you want to continue that recognition because yourself can kind of multiply like your recognition yourself deepens and articulates and you know the more you proceed through each of those doors you know it's it's about and i think perhaps it's it's to do with with voice, you know, it's to do with hearing and recognizing through a poet's particular voice. And um, I think we have these poets, you know, our, our traveling sort of little shelf of gods and goddesses, our poets that we take with us through our lives and careers. And we return to some of them and some of them get abandoned and fall off along the way. Um, but we're always making space, I think. I mean, I would, I would not want to say, okay, this is my altar and, and that's it. You know, I'm always thinking, uh, what's a new voice? Because I think it's true, the contagion of other voices that we then find new voice in us as, po as a poet, you know? Yeah. And, and so the, it, it, it's, 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 it's to do with, with, uh, it's sort of selfish in a way because I think it's partly to do with saying I know that I have all these hidden things and I want to be able to bring out this or bring that out and and so sometimes you come across a poet you've never heard of and it's so exciting if it shifts something in you you know yeah yeah absolutely absolutely um, I'm kind of latched onto something you said a little bit earlier um, that I'm going to paraphrase as the, the effervescence of the present, um, that kind of bubbling excitement and energy. Um, mm. I think that there's also this very fascinating and productive tension, and, and, and this is going back to this question of time, um, mm. and where I feel in the poems that you confront the present with the ancient. Um, and I think, and this is maybe in an effort to 
wrangle the present to to stall it to slow it um but also as a way of re-articulating re-understanding what's happening in the present um anyone who go who looks through the note section of a god at the door will see that you're absolutely responding to news events um and to to really the cruelties and sufferings of our contemporary age um uh my colleague vero who helped me put together some questions she had a really wonderful question about your use of allegory uh in poems like um blue mormon or uh, mr frog and marilyn monroe poem um and so i kind of want to ask a little bit about fable and allegory and these kind of these ancient feeling stories and, and the ancient practice of storytelling and how you use that to address the horrors of our contemporary world yeah, yeah um i was thinking as well about um another point of entry which was reading these old uh, 2000 year old tamil love poems which are also eco poems and how that was for me the sense of Wow, because these were poems which were written 2000 years ago, but they could have been written yesterday. And I think, uh, but they're also from this landscape that I inhabit. And I think as a poet, I'm always interested in the lyric, that sense of the poem existing uh, in its own universe, like sort of unattached to the news and unattached to the time that it's in, but just sort of springing out from it and, and existing in this timeless time, right? I think, I think most people go to poetry for that or want some sense of that. Um, but that, that sense of that effort, you know, that effervescence that you were talking about, that contemporary fizz is also so, so seductive to me, that sense of poetry's elasticity of being able yeah. to respond to the now that we are living in, which has surely always been beautiful and horrible, not just now, it's, mm -hmm. it's always been yeah. in its history. And so, um, so I think you're always playing with these different time zones uh, as a writer, uh, definitely even as a, as a novelist, but as a poet, somehow because of the because of the smallness of a poem it's such a grand endeavor because it seeks to it seeks to hold so much a poem you know it's it's really ambitious the poem i think um more so than the novel which has so many pages to chunner on about this that and the other and i think that in that sense poems are so magical to me because of exactly this that they are uh, trying to contain these different registers always, you know, and, and then I think orality for me has been very important and the sense of fable and allegory and why we have these sort of symbols to represent and this sort of hiddenness uh, of poetry is important because that's the magic. And I think poetry is a kind of magic and it's about creating these layers and um, these sort of little screens, if you will, and and sort of uh, sometimes you may not get all of them, and you know you you kind of need to read the poem a few times over, and and more is revealed. But but I like that that sense of play also. I really I think more and more I feel like play is very important, um, and because it's such a we are faced with so many serious concerns that it becomes so overwhelming. And depressing <laughs> to write about them yeah. that that it has to be injected with lightness and and play in a way to release the poem you know yeah i don't know yeah. if that answered i don't know if that answered your question no it, 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 it <laughs> my question and many others um i think um <laughs> i i'm very uh, once again kind of latched on to as you were as you were describing this like i love this idea of the poem is I mean, I, I, what I kind of conjured immediately was like the poems, like this child who doesn't fully understand the powers uh, they wield yet, you know, or something like that. But, um, but I love the idea of magic, and and I had all these um, actually these questions about about transformation and metamorphosis. Um, also, I think dynamics that happen a lot um, in the work. Um, but I kind of maybe want to pause on that and um, uh, address something that. Um, this, this this question of play um and so i'm because I'm, i'd like to kind of talk a little bit about your craft too and um one so you know uh you've you've sort of talked at length and in, 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 in other interviews and you've just we've talked you've talked about um the new kind of uh, formal um 
the visual kind of elements of the poems, the center justified, um, the concrete poems that, you know, there's uh, the, the mm -hmm. Pliny the Elder poem with that looks like a menstrual cup and things. Um, another kind of element of play though, um, that I kind of want to talk about maybe a little bit more is your ear, um, your sense of rhythm and also materiality. Uh, there are so many moments in these poems are so sonically material. They're great they're great to read out loud. Um, they're great to kind of chew on and, and that sort of thing. And I'm curious um, if you, well, maybe put it this way, like, are you a slow writer or a fast writer? How long do you linger on lines as you're constructing um, these things? Where's that rhythm inside you? Yeah. Uh, I, I, I think I'm both slow and fast. <laughs> Sometimes <laughs> the poem comes, arrives, you know, um, but I think, you know, sound is, is that I, I'm really glad that you brought up that, so, that sense of the sonic uh, element. I really feel um, that there is a part of poetry where a poem is only alive when it's read, do you know? This is, this is coming from a sort of ancient sort of, sort of aesthetic of, of poetry here in India where uh, you know, for, for hundreds of years, poems were only ever spoken aloud. They were memorized and then they existed like that. And then many years, you know, hundreds of years later, somebody wrote them down. So you don't even know the authorship. It's kind of a collective effort. You know, somebody emerges from these poems and we think it is so-and-so or so-and-so. Um, but there was this real um, belief that the poem only existed when you spoke it, and that that was the power of the poem. And I think, as as much as I love the page, and as much as the page for me is this sense of um, you know having all the 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 forest of this book. These are the poems. These are the trees in that forest. You know, I like the idea of books and collections very much. Yeah. I don't like them to just be messily hanging around. Um, that sense of being able to speak the poem aloud, to memorize. Uh, the poems. Uh, I try to um, memorize a lot of the poems simply because I feel that once the poem then begins to live inside you in that way, it's out of the page, it's inside your body, it's in your mouth, it's there in your throat, uh, it takes on this other um, uh, this other level, you know, not almost another persona in a way. So the poem is the same, but it exists in a different level. And I really think that for me, uh, playing like the visual thing is a new experiment and I, I, I think partly it's because um, I'm interested in shape and how things are held and I think that you can do that with a poem as well but it's in general poetry is the most elastic of, of writing forms because of its ability to respond whether it's to film or whether it's with sound and movement. And because I'm a dancer, I just feel that in some ways, um, poetry has this, uh, these superpowers. These are the superpowers of, of poems, you know, uh, that they can uh, exist in, in such a small way on a page and then become so large when spoken out loud uh, or committed to memory, you know. If you've all learned a poem by heart, and you know that poem, uh, you know, for me, stopping by the woods on a snowy evening, we had to learn that Robert Frost poem. And mm -hmm. That poem has changed over the years because I know that poem. That poem now is my poem, do you know? Yeah. And so there's a shift of ownership. And I think I love that about poems, that they are small enough to memorize and then you, you can take ownership of them. Yeah, yeah, that's I, I love that sense of ownership. And I, I often I often describe to people that I, I think of poems as pocketable, you you can carry them with you through through the airport terminal, you know, or, or wherever it yeah. is. Yeah, 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 I think it's really wonderful. Um, well, I want to um, I, 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 I kind of want to move us into this, this other note of time, which is this, this sense of standing at an end of something. And, and, and I think this came up in the poem that you read. And, and it's also something I just mm -hmm. see um, a lot. And, and so I kind of, I kind of want to just ask this frank question if I can um, to you, Tashani, which is, um, wh what are you afraid of? Um, what, what are your fears? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> everything. I'm afraid yeah. of everything. I, <laughs> I am too. I mean, just about everything. No, but, but, yeah. I think I'm a writer um, because of, I think, fear and shame. I think those are the two things that mm. made me a poet. 
um, and that brought me to writing in the first place. I was a very imaginative child and I was terrified of everything. I mean, I, I used to think just danger is lurking around every corner. And I remember um, later in life, maybe when I was in my 20s or something, I remember my mother saying to me, she said, you know, she said, Tish, you're, you're so brave. I can't remember the context that I nearly fell over because mm -hmm. this was a woman who had left her little village in North Wales and fallen in love with my father and moved to India in 1969 and done this crazy uh, move across the world because she fell in love with somebody and then lived in India, you know, and, and then just moved her life there. And I, I always thought she was the brave one. And I just thought it's so interesting how people see us as being brave or cowardly and how we see our, ourselves. And certainly I think as, as I've grown, I, I, I've known how to manage fear, but the fear is there. But it's just a question of saying, okay, how are you going to, and, and you want to be fierce, you want to be strong, you want to be somebody who strides out into the world and says, I have this and I have poems and I have language and I, you know, I believe in X, whatever. And, and so you, you want to harness a kind of power and you believe it. It's not a fake thing. That power is real. Um, but I think the fears never go away and they're so, they're so primal and they're, they're what make us, um, uh, you know, human. It's the sense of mortality, death. Death, there, there yeah. it is. The, the worst fear of all is not just my death, but the death of beloved, the death of planet, the death of, of, of things around you and, and um, loss. And I think uh, there's, there's always this, this, this sense of lament that is very, very yeah. strong. Uh, and, and then all you can do to counter it is to go towards the odes and to go towards praise and go towards joy and go towards beauty because that is the only thing that will secure us somehow within this lament you know yeah yeah absolutely yeah and and i mean as you said i'm thinking of poems like and, and i'm just reciting these titles off the top of my head but variations on hippo which i think is that you're one of the main algaes in, in in the book um and that idea of of loss and, and mourning um as being something that can be sort of beautifully rendered, you know. Um, and again, I think we're getting back to this kind of idea of this, the sanctuary space of the poem. Um, and yeah, well, that leads me to uh, I'm, I'm I, I feel that maybe we're coming to a little bit of a, a of an end here. And and I I, I kind of see this fork in the road that we can either let me pose this question to you. We can maybe talk about hope, um, or maybe mm -hmm. maybe you just hear we could hear one more poem. Um, yeah, yeah. To, whatever you'd like to do, I think. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. um, well, um, I don't know. I, I mm -hmm. hope is such a, it's, it's a really tricky thing. I, I, I think mm -hmm. I consider myself a very, a kind of a, a happy person, optimist actually. Yeah. Um, but I think it's because I write that I can say that. I think if I didn't write, I would be distraught, yeah. do you know? I remember at a reading once, um, I had uh, in an older collection, a, a book, a, a poem that I wrote after Elizabeth Bishop's, um, you know, um, you know, and uh, about the art of losing and, and it, it sort of goes with this whole thing about all the fears, you know, it sort of and it builds and then how the one day you see your parents and then, you know, they're on the, on the mossy grass and, and then you know that you have to, you have to then jump into oblivion without your wings, you know, this kind of thing. And then the yeah. person came up to me after the reading and said, wow, you really are a pessimistic person, you know? <laughs> And I said, no, I absolutely am not. Um, the poets, the poems uh, deal with loss and the poems uh, are, are confronting these things, but that is not to submit to it. That is to try and work in this area of transformation that we are trying to convert or make bearable something that is deeply troubling to us, the, viol the many violences 
that we endure as as people that we are kind of bombarded with and so the poem is against all that and the very act of writing a poem is an act of optimism to imagine that it will reach somewhere that someone's life may be changed by it or that someone's day might be changed by reading a poem that you wrote so i think that poetry is inherently optimistic no matter how dire or how filled with lament they may be because through the act of the poem you have uh it is written with a kind of hope if you had no hope you could not write the poem you see and so so hope exists however tenuous uh it's it's sort of this sense of always um trying to trying to go from one direction and move us into the other and so the poem uh the poem can move through various uh stages of emotion uh but there will always be a small window uh where it offers us either laughter or beauty or something that we can hold on just an image you know uh, even if it's just an image and and that's that that's the thing that stays is, is an image that the poem gives you and i think all of that all of that is is hopeful to me mm. yeah that's beautiful um well tashani you've you've given me a lot to hold on to and to hope for <laughs> these poems truly do give me hope um and this conversation is so nourishing um so i i feel like i'm going to have a good day today um because of it good so. <laughs> well, it was it was so lovely to talk to you and i'm so glad that we had no um electricity breakdown where i am or any tech problems yeah all good no everything everything was very <laughs> and, calm i think yeah <laughs> yes yes all calm no dogs howling and <laughs> other dogs stray enemy packs um <laughs> Yeah, no no dangers for the moment. It's it's peaceful and calm. I'll go down and make dinner and um thank you for your questions. It was really really lovely to talk to you. Yeah, it was really nice to talk with you. Um and and I'm glad to just kind of share a little bit of your ideas with our readers and 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 the viewers of um of uh, Line Break. So here at we're second season, we're just getting kicked off. So um thank you for giving us such a great start. Um